Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. So Romans chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. And the word of the Lord reads, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of Sancria, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Apinetus, who was the first convert in Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who was who had worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelatus, my beloved in the, the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stichus. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphenia, Tryphosa. Greet beloved Persis, who was who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Greet Asychronitus and Phlegon, Hermes and Patrobus, Hermas and the brothers who were with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, Nerus, and his sisters, Olympus, and all the saints who were with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve the Lord, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to us all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise, so to do so to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under their, your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sopater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me, and the whole church greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. This is the word of the Lord. Two more. Two more sermons, and we are finally finished with our walk through the letter to the Romans in our series titled The Power of the Gospel. And it all began with Paul declaring the truth that we, a truth that we all hold so dear, and the truth is simply this the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes, and that the righteous will live by faith. The gospel, the most important and beloved subject in all of the Christian faith, and Paul writes this letter to the Romans to not only prepare them for his arrival, but to impact for them the most complete exposition of the gospel. And we, and as we've said, we know what we know about the gospel really because of, of this letter here. We understand the gospel as well as we do because of what Paul has written here in this letter. And it's the foundation of our faith. The gospel 
is the foundation of all that we believe, and it is the foundation of our unity in Christ. In chapters 1 through 11, Paul explains what the gospel is, the bad news that we're separated from God because of our sin, but it's also then the good news that we can be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work for us. Paul then explains the blessings that the gospel gives to those who believe, peace with God, grace to live, and the love of God poured out into our hearts. And then he tells us how the gospel works, that the truth is that we were born into sin because of Adam, but we, because of Christ, can be set free from sin and the wrath of God. And he gives us then assurance of all of our hope in the gospel. He tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that he assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And then from Romans 12 through 15, Paul explains what life ought to look like for those who are trusting in Christ. We are to offer our entire lives to Him as a living sacrifice. And we are to not allow ourselves to be conformed to the world, but instead to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And practically speaking, we are to live as good neighbors towards those around us and as good citizens within whatever country we might reside. And we are to live unified in the community of faith, which is the church. And even more specifically, we are to love each other and to serve each other and to endure each other's shortcomings. All of this is for the glory of God. And all of this is pointed towards the mission that we are all called to, which is to redeem the lost. And then last week, Paul helped us to see that we are to trust in God's sovereignty and we're to walk in faith as those who have been transformed by the power of the gospel. But this week, Paul begins to wrap up this letter. And what I want you to see is that Paul makes a point to remind us of the unity that we have in the diversity of the body of Christ. But then he also reminds us that this unity must be built on the truth of the Christian faith. We must be unified, even though that we're very different from one another in many respects. But what we have in common is the gospel that we all cling to. And so looking at chapter 16, Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of Sancria, that you may welcome her in, in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she's been a patron to many and of myself as well. The thing that that we know is Paul plans to visit Rome, but he can't go at this moment. And so he takes this letter and he gives it to Phoebe and sends her off with it. And the first thing that, that I want you to see is that he calls her sister. And this is important because one of the things that often is ignored in our culture, especially of its criticism of the Christian faith, is that it is the Christian faith, it is Christ and His church that has elevated the status of women throughout the entire world. The truth is that at one point, at this point in history, that women in the Roman culture and in the Jewish culture were seen, you know, seen as property rather than people. They were seen really as something to own. And they weren't even trusted or even valued the way that men were. But here Paul not only trusts Phoebe with this important letter, he makes a point to call her sister and lets the Romans know that she's important to him and he expects her to treat her like family. And so he acknowledged her worth, he acknowledges her work and the contribution to the mission of Christ. He even calls her in the Greek a deaconess, a servant. And this is not unlike the word that is used for deacon today. Now, some will say that Phoebe is an example of pastoral leadership in the church, but the context really doesn't warrant that. And given Paul's clear teaching on the qualifications of elders and pastors in 1 Timothy, saying Phoebe was an elder or pastor is to really kind of take this out of its context and really miss, I think, the important point of, of our, our unity together. But that notwithstanding, Paul does make it clear that the Christian faith is made up of and held together by both men and women. And contrary to what people say today, the Christian faith 
has not been oppressive to women, but rather is the basis of women being seen as equals to men in all reaches of the world and in almost all cultures. Even Paul more emphatically declares in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 28, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And so Paul commends Phoebe to the Roman church, and he sends her away with his greetings, greetings towards many people in Rome. And this greeting section extends from, from verse 3 all the way to 16. And, and because of this, we realize that there are a lot of people that, that Paul actually knew who were in Rome at the time, either through meeting them personally like Priscilla and Aquila or hearing about them from other Christians. And there are several reasons why Paul would, 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 you know, would basically know so many Roman uh, citizens, even though he'd never been to Rome. First was the fact that Rome was the capital city. As, is, as we've heard before, all roads lead to Rome. Roman was the capital city of the entire Roman Empire, and that meant millions of people traveled to and from Rome. And everybody had met at least some people or known some people that had lived there or visited there. Secondly, in this stage of history, we know that is known as the Pax Romana or the Roman peace for all of the negatives that are associated with the Roman Empire. One of the things that, they, that the Roman Empire did bring was peace to the region. And so this was a time of relative peace throughout Europe and Asia Minor, and people were free to travel and to, to go long distances safely and relatively quickly because of the transportation networks there. And third, as we talked about before, the Roman emperor at one point had expelled all the Jews from the city of Rome, including the Jewish Christians, which is why the church became really numbered uh, by many Gentile Christians. And many of these Jewish Christians temporarily had to move to other cities like Ephesus. And so Paul likely met a number of them on his way. Now at some point, now the point again is Paul, in this part of the letter, Makes, makes a clear decision to call out by name a very dis, d- diverse group of people who were in Rome at the time of this writing, people that he knew or either heard about, and he makes a point to tell the Roman church to greet them for him, and he acknowledges them by name, and he commends them for their faithfulness. And, and it would be profitable for you to read that list again and study these people in the list But for our purposes this morning, there's something specific, I think, that we all just really need to see. And that is Paul's greeting here is a glorious display of the diversity of people that are found in the family of God. And I don't think we can overstate that or overthink that. What we see here in this list of people is a glorious display of the diverse nature of the people in in the family of God. At a time, right, at, at a time when people really segregated themselves according to culture, people, even like today, people segregated them, themselves over a number of reasons. But what we see here is the family of God is made up of people from distinct walks of life and backgrounds. Notice again that Paul mentions both males and females in this list. And again, I can't overstate that at a time when women's testimony in court was seen as unreliable. At a time when women were seen as property, Paul sends his greeting to several women and gives them credit for their faithfulness and expresses his appreciation for their work. The Christian faith has elevated women because they were valued members of God's family, equals in the family of God. Next, notice the diversity in ethnicity. When Paul reads this list, you'll discover that the family of God is made up from people from very different ethnic groups and very different cultures. In this list, you'll find Semitic names like Mary. You'll find Greek names as well as Latin names. And the point I want us to embrace is our unity in Christ supersedes all of our other identities. In fact, if there's one thing that, you'll, that, that I would encourage you to take out of here and walk with out of here and remember is that our identity in Christ supersedes all of our other identities. 
And this is important and relevant, especially today, because we live in a world and a culture that seeks to divide us in many ways, but especially along the lines of skin color. The, the, the woke critical race theory movement seeks to divide us according to the melanin count in our bodies. Right? And let's be honest. Right? We, see, we see it almost at every level. There is an overemphasis and an overfocus on the color of people's skin. But our identity is not in how dark or light our skin is. It's in Christ. Vodi Bauckham, who is a preacher who has profoundly influenced my ministry, and if you've never listened to him before, then you've not really heard, I would say, excellent preaching if you haven't. Um, I would encourage you to just type into YouTube Vodi Bauckham and listen to anything he said. But he's profoundly influenced my personal ministry, uh, he's influenced my walk in Christ. I've heard him preach in, uh, like in person multiple times. I actually kind of bumped into him, rubbed elbows with him in, in the, the hotel gym in Atlanta, Georgia. Super nice guy. Um, but he has said that he is one of the most hated men in the woke Christian movement, even though he himself has a very, very, very high melanin count. And the reason for that is because he makes it clear that he does not identify himself as a black Christian. He hates that label. He identifies as a Christian first and foremost, and the skin, the color of his skin is irrelevant for that end. As he says, we are all one in Christ. When you survey the scriptures, what you find is that God's plan for his family, his elect, is to be made up of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and skin color. We're supposed to be a diverse group of people united in a common faith in Christ. The next, what we see is the diversity of socioeconomics. The family of God is made up of both rich people and poor people. Well-educated and uneducated, sophisticated and not quite so sophisticated. Phoebe was one of those people who was well-off. She had a lot of means. That's why she was able to lend so much support. Aquila and Priscilla were, were, were um, bivocational in their ministry. They, they worked as tent makers. And there were people who were dirt poor in the family of God. And again, this is again relevant for us today because today, you know, our culture wants to create animosity between classes. That's what we're, I mean, if you've not been paying attention, that's what they're talking about in, in almost every commercial and all the political ads. If you're rich, you're supposed to look down your nose at those who are poor as if they're beneath you. And if you're poor, you're supposed to despise and be jealous of the rich because they're rich and somehow they're oppressing you. But that is not what we see in the family of God. We see both rich and poor living together, serving each other, building each other up, and building up the body of Christ for the glory of God. We also see the diversity in, in the locations of the church. Paul writes this letter from Corinth. Phoebe was, was from the church in Sincrea. I don't even know where that is. Aquila and Priscilla worked in Ephesus, and this letter is sent to the church in Rome. What we, what we can gather from this list is the body of Christ is a diverse group of people with varying backgrounds and ethnicities, cultures, and experience, and they're, they, are, they are also from different places. And the thing I think that oftentimes we forget, or especially the American church forgets, is the church locally is within the walls, but the, the church universally is outside of the walls. And, and as, a, as a clear picture of that unity, um, Brother Ephraim is here today to come and worship with us, even though he's a part of another church family across the tracks. He's displaying his love for you as a congregation to come and do that. Because why? He understands that we are one family united in Christ. All of this diversity helps us to see the beauty of the glorious unity that's founded in the body of Christ. Unity that's founded on real love, as Christ said, that we're to love one another as I have loved you. By this kind of love, 
that everyone else will know that you're my disciples. It's a love that's founded on respect, recognizing in one another that we are all made in the image of God. And because we are in Christ, we are all sinners saved by the grace of God. It's also a relationship built on real fellowship, like the fellowship that we have here on Sunday morning and the fellowship we had on Friday night. It was a blessing just to spend time with you all, even outside of here, to be able to talk and just you know, get to know each other a little bit better and, and share a meal. It's also a unity built on affection. We really, truly care about one another. Now, Paul mentions a holy kiss here, which I think is a little far, okay? I mean, I'm okay with you if you don't, you, you, if you don't want to kiss me and that I don't kiss you back, right? But we get the point. You know, a handshake and a hug is perfect for that, right? Just so you know. So if you kiss me right here, I might look, look at you really weird, okay? Um, but it's also a unity built on hospitality. Being there for one another, right? Spending time together, inviting each other in, in our homes, and, and really getting to know one another. But most importantly, this unity is founded on the truth, the immovable truth of our faith. The fact is, our unity can only exist if the foundation we build that unity on is the common faith that we have in Christ. Paul writes in verse 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrines that you have been taught. Avoid them. Right? So Paul had spent all this time talking about what the gospel is, how to live in light of the gospel. And then he greets everybody and he just has to one more time say it really, really clear. You got to watch out for false teachers and false doctrines. He makes it clear that the division in the church doesn't come because of the diversity of skin color. He makes it clear that, that, that the division in the church is not because of our cultural differences or our background differences. The division in the church is the result of false doctrine and false teachers. And again, this is a timely message for us today because there are people today who gather as Christians who blindly and immaturely will say things like, doctrine divides. No creed but Christ. And I understand the motivation behind that. I want you to understand that. I'm not blaming them for that. In a world that seems where everybody's arguing about everything, it just seems so simple to just try to strip our Christian faith down to a couple nuts and bolt things and then just act like that we don't need to really focus on the elements of our faith that are true. But I want you to hear me. This is a lie from the devil himself. It's perpetuated even among some who genuinely are converted to Christ. They repeat this falsehood because it fits this postmodern philosophy that the truth isn't really concrete. By the way, it's a philosophy that the entire world is steeped in. But it is a lie. Doctrine doesn't divide. False doctrine divides the body of Christ. True doctrine, the essential truths of our faith are what unite us and hold us together in our common bond. We must hold on to the essentials of our faith. As Paul in Galatians chapter 1 admonishes and, and rebukes the church in Galatia. In fact, most of Paul's letters, when you, when you read them, have an extended greeting and a lot of pleasantries. If you read Galatians, you'll find he gets right to the point. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and, and are turning to a different gospel, not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. More specifically, he's saying, let them be damned. As we've said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. There is a doctrine that leads to life and is the basis of, of what unifies us together as a family. And we must hold these truths if we are to be in Christ and if we're to have any hope of being united together. Okay, pastor, what are the truths then? It seems so many people have different competing ideas 
All right? How do we know what the truth is? Well, that's why the church from early on began to create confessions and creeds is to very clearly tell us and to distill for us the essential things we need to believe. That's why the confessions of faith are so important. Confessions of faith take the whole of Scripture and then distill them down to clear, understandable doctrines for us to read and to study and to meditate on and then to ultimately agree with. And here at First Baptist Church, the confession that represents the bulk of what we teach here is the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. And, and the reason why we lean on this so heavily is, first of all, because we're Baptists, right? But this confession is historic, and it is built upon the Westminster Confession of Faith and built upon other confessions that go all the way back to the early church, and it connects us historically to the essential things that Christians have believed from the very beginning, things that have united the church together from the very beginning. Secondly, it is robust. Many churches adopt a very weak and oversimplified uh, statement of faith to appeal to the widest possible audience, but because they are vague and very general and not so specific, there is room for error. Our confession is very detailed and robust, giving us clear left and right limits, so to speak, into the things that we believe. And then the third thing is it's clear. The confession of faith, when you read it, you realize it's, it clearly expresses the essential things that we are to know and believe and to have assurance in to be part of the family of God. Now, short of reading this entire confession of faith this morning, I want to briefly just look at the essentials, the essential things that I think that we must hold to in order to be unified as a body of believers. And that begins, first of all, with the doctrine of the Word of God, the Bible itself. What we believe about the Word of God is essential to our unity. And there are four things I, I believe that the Word of God, that we ought to believe about the Word of God for us to be able to be unified in our faith. Number one, we ought to believe that the Scriptures, all of it, is God's Word to us. A lot of people want to think that it's just mankind writing down some inspired notes and thoughts. It is not that. Paul explicitly tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, all Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And the thing that we need to see here is that Paul uses a word that creates a word picture for us to be able to see. The word that he uses for breathed out is the word theonoustos. It literally means God exhaling. And the picture that Paul's trying to conjure up in our minds is the way that we talk. How do we talk? We exhale. That's how we speak. And what Paul is trying to communicate is these words in Scripture are God's words spoken, obviously through men that are inspired and, and moved along by the Holy Spirit to write what God wants us to know. The idea being communicated is that these scriptures are God's word to us. In fact, people say all the time, I'd like to hear from God. Then read it, <laughs> right? He spoke to you. It's already right here. The, the, the word of God, the Bible, is his word to us. It's not just an inspired doc, you know, document. It's not just a few guys that have some truths. It is the truth because it is God's word. Secondly, the word is authoritative. This is why we affirm the doctrine of sola scriptura, or scripture alone. The scripture is authoritative for our life and for our faith. It gives us direction in how to live. It gives us direction in how to follow Christ. And it gives us clear direction on how to find life. But most importantly, it's our final authority. All of our doctrines, all of our confessions of faith, all of the teachings you have ever heard, all of those things must be submitted to the authority of Christ, through the authority of the Word of God. It has the final say on those things. 
And the reason why this is essential is because our final authority is not in what men tell us. I beg you, do not just take my word blindly for anything that is said to be from the scriptures. I invite you and encourage you to read it yourself. I am not infallible. The word of God is. And so our authority is not some charismatic leader. It's not some church council. It's not our personal emotions or even our dreams. The Bible is our final authority on the gospel and salvation and the nature of God and how we are to live in light of the gospel. And then not only is it authoritative, but it's infallible, meaning that it doesn't fail. The Word of God never fails to accomplish what it, it, God has intended for it to accomplish. The Word of God is sufficient to do everything that God intends for it to do. And then the Scriptures are inerrant, meaning they are without error. The doctrine of inerrancy, we affirm, is that the Scriptures are inerrant in their original writings. And what we know by critical scholarship is what we have here is almost exactly what was written down um, in the original documents. And so we can affirm the inerrancy of, uh, of God's Word. And this doctrine is, is, is important, but it is not very popular in our modern context because people today, because of their personal agendas, want to believe that, that some parts of this Bible aren't really true. And maybe Paul got some things wrong, or maybe Moses got some things wrong. People look for loopholes to be able to justify standing in contrast to the clear teachings of the Scriptures. But inerrancy is essential to our faith because if the Word of God is not inerrant, or, but it's only inspired in some way, then how can you ever really fully trust it? Because who gets to decide then what part of it's true and what's not true? We stand on the truth that the Bible is inerrant, and I believe that's an essential to our faith. The second category of doctrines that are essential is the nature of God Himself. You will never understand yourself. You will never understand the gospel. You will never understand your need for Him unless you actually have a picture of who God is. What we believe about God is essential to our faith. And among the things that, that we must believe is the fact that there is only one true and living God. If there is one thing that you will see throughout scriptures is that repeated theme. Repeatedly, scriptures bear witness to the fact that there is only one God and His name is Yahweh. Your Bibles you know, translate that as, as the Lord. But it means that all other gods or supposed gods or false gods, whether they're the Roman pantheon of gods or the idols that people worship or the billions of Hindu gods, there is only one God and anyone who denies that is not part of the faith and not part of the family of God. We also must affirm the essential attributes of God, that God is spirit and not material. God is not a material being in spite of what many, even in our own community, might say about Him. God is something altogether different from us. He is not like us, which leads to His holiness. The word holy means to be set apart, but what it really means is God is absolutely in every possible conceivable way unique, and there's none like Him. We sing that all the time. There's none like you, because only He is self-existing. Only He is eternal. We don't even understand what that means, and only He is sovereign. God is unlike anything in all of creation. That's why when you read the scriptures, when they say of God, He is holy, holy, holy. The emphasis is He is the absolute most epitome of holiness. He is unlike anything in creation, which means He's also immutable. Unlike us, He doesn't change. And He is the creator of all other things. There's really only two categories of existence, and I think that we need to lean on that and hold fast to that. There's only two categories of existence. There is God, and then there's everything that He's created. There's nothing outside of that, which means everything that 
that, that exists from the tiniest subatomic particle to us in this room to the largest galaxy at the most distant point in the universe, all of that owe their existence to Him and were created by Him. As we sang this morning, the universe declares His majesty. And then there's the triune nature of God. Again, one that's pushed back on by some groups. But our confession of faith puts it this way. This divine and infinite being consists of three real persons, the Father, the Word, or Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three have the same substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence without this essence being divided. The Father is not derived from anyone being begotten, either begotten or proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. All three are infinite and without beginning, and therefore only one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being. Yet there are three, yet these three are distinguished by several distinctive characteristics and personal relations. This truth is the of the Trinity is the foundation of all our fellowship with God and our comforting dependence upon Him. God is one in essence and three in persons. And anyone who denies the triune nature of, Christ, of God is not in Christ. I know that's not popular to say nowadays in a world that's aiming towards plurality, but we cannot escape the triune nature of God. Not because it completely fits inside of our head, but because that's how God has revealed Himself to us. The third major doctrine category is the nature of man. Who were we? Well, one of the first things, and I think is often one of the first things forgotten, is that all of mankind is created in the image of God. It's easy to forget that when we have people we don't like. But, mean, but that means that all people are endowed with an inherent dignity. Not because of who they are, but because of Him and who He is. That is why we are to love and respect all of the people. Because they bear the image of their Creator. Secondly, God created mankind, male and female. Again, this is something that our culture pushes back on, but God in His wisdom and His sovereignty and according to the counsel of His own will saw fit to make men this way, male and female. And I want you to understand, no matter what we're told, this is as immutable and unchangeable as anything else. No matter how much the world wants to deny that and chastise us, for standing firm on this truth. Also is the truth that humanity is fallen by nature because of Adam. There, there's something in us that wants to just believe that somehow people are, are intrinsically good, they just make some mistakes, and that all they need to be is it cleaned up a little bit. The, the Scriptures have nothing to say about that at all. The Scriptures make it clear that we're all sinners. Paul says, none is righteous, no, not one. He tells all of us in Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. We are all sinners by nature and by choice. And our confession summarizes the scriptures this way. By this sin, our first parents fell from their original righteousness and communion with God. We fell in them and through this, death came to, upon all. All became dead in sin and completely defiled in, the cap in all the capabilities and parts of soul and body. It's not that we're not capable of doing good things. It's just that everything that we are is tainted by sin. Our minds, our bodies, the way we think, the way we reason, even our emotions. All of humanity is in rebellion to God and have no hope of saving themselves. This is essential for us to hold on to. Anyone who denies this really doesn't understand the gospel. The fourth category of doctrine that we need to be unified in is the person of Christ. We must affirm some important things about Him. First of all, His full divinity. Jesus is fully God. This, I know that some people really struggle with that, but the Scriptures make it clear. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus himself used the term, I am, to make very clear that he is God in the flesh. He even told his own, his own 
disciples. You asked to see the Father, but here I am with you. You've not, and you're going to tell me you haven't seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Over and over and over and over again, the inescapable truth is, is that Jesus is fully God, and we must believe that. But we also must affirm His full humanity. Jesus, when He came to, earth, to the earth, became fully a man. As John writes, the Word became flesh. Jesus took on a full human nature and became one of us. And He walked with us and He suffered with us and He suffered for us. Jesus came into the world to, to do for us all the things we couldn't do for ourselves, which then leads to the fifth major doctrine that we need to hold on to, the work of Christ which includes His virgin birth. The Scriptures tell us that He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and was, was born to the Virgin Mary. This is a doctrine that was so important that the earliest creeds made mention of the fact that He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. We also must believe the truth about His righteous life as a part of His work. See, the thing is, is we... Are, we we are, as we believe, saved by grace through faith. But we're also saved by works. Now, before you throw me out of here, we're saved by the works of Christ. Because somebody had to fulfill the law. Somebody had to earn the righteousness that Adam lost in the garden. Righteousness must be fulfilled, and Christ lived the perfect righteous life that's required of us that we couldn't live and did for us all that we couldn't do as our federal head, offering us a righteousness we could never earn on our own. And then we must believe in His atoning death. Christ bore the wrath of God that's reserved for all of us. He shed His blood to make atonement for our sin. And this is important because He didn't simply die as an act of love in order to pers persuade us to come to Him. I cannot for the life of me fathom why people want to diminish the sacrificial atonement and, and make what Christ did simply just an act of love as a sacrifice that might just melt our hearts so we might just believe. No, what He did on the cross accomplished something. It satisfied God's justice and wrath. That's why we sing in Christ alone. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Christ's atoning death is something we must believe in, but we also must believe in His literal, physical resurrection. His lifeless body that was brutally destroyed was raised to new life. His resurrection was not something, just a spiritual thing that happened as some Gnostics would, would, would tell you. The hum, his human body was restored to new life. And this is essential to our faith, but also essential to our hope because it's our hope as well. The resurrection. And the last thing about his work is his intercessory work at the right hand of the Father. When Christ ascended to heaven, He didn't just stop working. He is still actively working, interceding for us right now as the Scriptures bear witness. The sixth major doctrine that we need to hold on to and believe is the hope of salvation, which is by grace alone. Grace alone. Because God alone is the one who saves he does not save us because somehow, some way that we've done something to be worthy of His salvation. He doesn't save us because, because somehow we did something funny that made Him laugh. He saves us simply because of His grace. He decided by His grace, even though that we don't warrant it, He decided to save us because of His own sovereign choice. And that we're saved by grace through faith alone. Paul writes, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. Truth is we must all exercise faith. And without faith, we cannot be saved. But that faith itself 
is a gift that God has granted us. And there's nothing that we can do to add to that. We do not save ourselves by our works. There's nothing we can do to earn God's salvation. And I'm going to tell you right now, as a new Christian, I struggled with this at first because I felt like now that I was saved, I had to spend the rest of my life earning that salvation. I'm glad that the Lord beat that out of me. The fact is, is it is by grace and we receive it by faith. And that faith must be in Christ alone. Not ourselves and the things that we can do for God. Not in saints, not in the, the Virgin Mary, not in some guru, not in some church. We must cling to and hold on to the object of our faith, which is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And then finally, I think the final doctrine I think we have to have our at least a, a basic belief in is the hope of consummation. Christ will return. He is coming back. And he will in his own time, in his own way, finish the redemptive work that God had started and conceived of in eternity past. Now, we don't know when. It could be 10 minutes from now or 10,000 years from now. But we can certainly know that he will return because that's the promise of Scripture. And really, it's the ultimate hope, the restoration of creation. Our hope is, is for when he will come back and finally set all things right and restore things the way they were created to be. That where we are all reconciled, finally, fully glorified in the relationship we were created for. These are the things that we must believe in order to have unity, in order to embrace one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And without them, we have no basis for unity. But if that's true, Pastor, then why do you have so many different denominations? And, and why do there so many different views and so many different issues? Well, the answer is simple. There's a number of things that, that people who seek to honor God find important, but really are not reasons for us to be divided as the family of God. As the old saying goes, in essentials, unity in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. A few non-essential issues include, like our mode of baptism. Now, we're Baptists for a reason. We feel strongly that people ought to confess Christ before they're baptized and think we have you know, a good historical basis for that. But we're not saved by our mode of baptism. This is why we can gladly embrace the our brothers and sisters in Christ who are Presbyterian and, and Lutheran. We affirm the fact that they hold on to the same essential truths that we do. Another, another thing that's, that sometimes people kind of get wrapped around the axle over, but we shouldn't be divided over, is, is sign gifts. As a Reformed Baptist, I lean towards a practical cessationism, meaning I do believe miracles can and do happen and that God can do whatever He wants and work any way that He wants, including healing people and causing people to speak in languages they don't know. But I don't believe it, it's, it's common and widespread. But I have brothers and sisters in Christ who don't agree with me on that, and, and they will let me know they don't agree with me on that. But guess what? That's completely okay. Because it's not essential to our common faith in Christ. Because it's not essential for us to have unity in the gospel. And this issue should never prevent us from loving each other and holding on to one another as family, regardless of our personal convictions about a non-essential like that. Another issue, another area where people will, will argue about but shouldn't become divided over is personal liberty in things like food or drink or tattoos or music or, or movies. There are some people who have strong feelings about dietary restrictions and, and for themselves and others believe that alcohol consumption isn't right for them and some people don't like tattoos and others shy away from secular uh, music and movies. That's their prerogative. While others don't feel any conviction with, about eating whatever they want to, such as pork, and seafood, and praise the Lord for bacon. Thank you very much. And others consume alcohol in moderation with a clear conscience, and, and some believe that even tattoos can be used to express their faith. And some people love worship music, but also like 
modern genres of music and are quite fine watching movies that aren't overtly Christian and can still see a redemptive theme. All of these issues, as we have seen in Romans, are a matter of conscience and never should be a barrier for our fellowship. They should never, ever prevent us from being united to one another. And one more I'll mention is the, is the area of, of, of eschatology or a person's personal view of the end times or the view of the millennium. Unfortunately, this has been an issue, I think, in the 20th century, but I think that's really kind of settled down as time has gone on. But, but some Christians have even questioned each other's salvation because they didn't see things eye to eye on this. And, and here's the thing is it really doesn't, it doesn't even really matter that much. And the reason why I can say that with confidence is I take great inspiration from, from the relationship of two men that, I ha- that have impacted my faith in ministry. I mean, people I still listen to even today, and that is John MacArthur and the late R.C. Sproul. If you have been a Christian for very long, you've heard both of those names. And what you need to understand is they were definitely two men that loved and respected each other, but there were some areas they had clear dis- disagreements about. John MacArthur held firm to dispensational theology, and he was premillennial in his view of the end times. Whereas R.C. Sproul in, in, embraced and taught a form of covenant theology, and he was all millennial in his view. Two very different ways of, of understanding the, the outworkings of Revelation. But despite this difference, despite the, the difference in, in some of the theological underpinnings there, they had multiple conversations together, and both of them wrote books, sometimes poking fun at each other. But despite of all of that, these two men had a real love and affection for one another. They, they worked together for the kingdom of God to the point where they both preached at each other's churches. They both spoke at each other's conferences. They were on many panels together and publicly continually affirmed their unity in the essentials in Christ. It, was, it is an inspiring relationship that gives me hope for the church in the future. This is a shining example of the beauty of the diversity and unity found in the essentials of the gospel that Paul encourages us to hold on here. And we ought to seek to live in light of the gospel the exact same way. We have brothers and sisters in Christ gathered in in buildings that are different from this one. And guess what? There are going to be some things where we're not going to see eye to eye on. But I can promise you, if we go across the tracks of the Boron Bible Church, that every one of the essentials that I had listed here... Pastor Matt will tell you that he believes and affirms and teaches right from his pulpit. The same thing with the Assembly of God Church. Again, we have some things that we don't hold in common, but what we hold in common unifies us as a body of Christ. That's why on Easter we will gather together as one larger church and worship the Lord and rejoice in the resurrection. This is the noble call that we are called to, to show grace and love to one another especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. But it says, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, but in everything let there be charity, which simply means grace and love. And that, my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, will be the hallmark of the unity that we have here, is that we go out into the world and we share love and grace, not just for the believers, but for everyone. That's why I think the, the Scriptures are so clear to tell us. Jesus said, to love one another as I have loved you, right? We are also told to love your neighbor as, what? Yourself. And then Jesus then, making clear who your neighbor is, even went so far to say, love your enemies. That right there, then, will be the byproduct of our unity in Christ, is that we can then demonstrate by our actions and our lives and our attitudes the love that God has put in us. And so what we see then as Paul wraps up the letter to the Romans is a diverse church family made up of people in different locations, from different ethnicities, different genders, different backgrounds, but unified in the common truths of the faith. And Paul then exhorts the church to avoid false teaching. In other places, he exhorts us to contend for our our faith. And that, brothers and sisters, is who we are, and I'm hoping to grow 
as, as First Baptist Church, when we had dinner Friday night, I just, I just loved our fellowship because you had people from all different age groups. You know, we had, we, we had um, some very young adults. Uh, we had some more mature adults. <laughs> and I think a little bit of everything in between. Different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different life experiences, different ways of looking at the world, but all coming together for one common purpose, to be in fellowship. And the basis of that fellowship is our faith in Jesus Christ. Let us never be ashamed to, to hold out the truth and stand for the truth, because it is the basis of our unity with Christ and one another. Let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world. 